Jen and Cam are two funny ladies who like to talk about murder, mass murder, murder suicide, serial killers, spree killers, thrill killers, contract killings, honor killings, and a whole lot of other shit. Too heinous for me to list here. If you're disturbed by this sort of content, you may want to listen to something else. And if you're a child trying to listen to our true crime podcast, well, you better ask your mama. <laughs> Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How you doing? I'm doing pretty okay. How are you? I'm doing great. Once again, like I said before, it's October. It is. Best month in the whole 12 months. You have a birthday coming up this weekend. I do. Aren't you excited? 40 Me and my menopausal self are so happy. Well, hey. Could be worse. (laughs) It could. It could. Don't invite it. Speaking of worse, here you have a case for us. I do. This one is actually a listener request. Dun, dun, dun. Christina Young and her husband requested this. They are over-the-road truck drivers, and they listen to us as they go along. I I mean, I I hope they still listen to us. This has been requested a while ago, um, so my apologies for it taking so long. Are we ready? I am so ready. Let's go. All right. Nestled between the flat coastal plain and one of the oldest mountain ranges in North America lies what is known as the Piedmont region of North Carolina. A plateau of gentle, rolling farmland, it is a home to the cities of Winston-Salem, Greensboro, and High Point. Known as the Triad, there are more than a dozen universities in this area, and it's become a hub of technology and research. One of the suburbs of Winston-Salem is a town called Clemens. There, folks speak with a soft southern draw and participate in council meetings. In October, they join the Monster Dash, and at Christmas time, there's the Festival of Lights. And in 2002, Clemens' Little League team made it all the way to the Little League World Series. Aww. The town of Mayberry, which is depicted in the beloved uh, Andy Griffin television show, Aww from the 60s was filmed just 40 minutes away. It's a very Christian town, very straight-laced, nice little town. And down the road from Costco, past the Hobby Lobby and the Chick-fil-A, stood a home on Knob Hill Drive that was in stark contrast to its surroundings. It was filthy and run down with a stench that assaulted people before they even reached the front porch. Once you did make it to the front porch, visitors were welcomed with a black door covered with symbols of skull and crossbones and an inverted cross. There was also like a huge skeleton skull with big bug eyes. I bet Um, that went over in that small town. It's beautiful. A community watch area sign warned that police were not welcome. Evil will triumph was written in bold white capital letters. Hmm. You know, it's, it's the kind of stuff that, you know... You knew that the occupants wouldn't be hosting a Tupperware party anytime soon. No, Mm -hmm. no. I was just thinking about not going to that house on Halloween night. But if none of that would make a person think twice about knocking on that door, surely the handwritten sign in black Sharpies would. It read, quote, no gang members allowed. Anyone that dresses the same has the same badge and calls themselves the authority of land they did not create. They only seize through terrorism, has no permission to enter this land unless they are a native since this is their land. Since this is the First Amendment of your fake laws, Mm. for we see you are guilty until proven innocent. If you can make laws, so can we. So be it. Somebody's not having a good day over there. (laughs) Somebody needs a nap. A little crabby. Mm Mm-hmm. Most likely penned in a drug-induced stupor by a person who could only read and write on an eighth grade level, the gist of the sign was that the owner of the house was informing law enforcement that they weren't allowed into the three-bedroom ranch on Knob Hill Drive because the owner had made up his own set of laws and that police officers were nothing more than gang members. And for the most part, the police let him and his tripped-out band of followers do their thing. Gossip through the neighborhood had scared some of the folks and intrigued others. 
the man who lived there, Pazuzu Illa Algarad, was a self-proclaimed Satanist who filed his teeth to sharp points and drank the blood of animals during the dark moon. Wait a minute, is that his real name? You'll see. And he filed his teeth. Wouldn't that hurt? You'd think. Don't you have nerve endings in your teeth? You do, don't you? Yeah. That hurt. It does. I'm assuming. I'm not going to try it. Don't animals have diseases? And does he t- does he dehair him or does he get hair in his teeth when he drinks their blood? I miss that day I, at the Satanist I, church. I just I, I, I don't just know. Have questions for I know I know Pazuzu. you might want to call a a vet about the drinking the blood. I think that's but, very healthy. Okay, go ahead. Pazuzu allowed and even encouraged people to engage in drug use, orgies, and murder in his own home. Murder. Uh, that's why you're hearing about it here. There's orgies. nothing. Up. Well, yeah. Okay. Sometimes they, they go together like peanut butter, peanut butter and jelly. And jelly. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing off limits in Pazuzu's home. It was littered with dead animals, trash, rotting food, and piles of human excrement. Ew. The blood-smeared walls were covered in graffiti, much of it in a combination of English, Arabic, and possibly made-up hier- hieroglyphics. How old is this Pazuzu fella? Mm, old enough to know better. I think I know the story. Pazuzu claimed to be the gatekeeper of hell, and for two men in 2009, this would prove to be true. And for two men in 2009, it would prove to be true. And unlike Lady Gaga, Pazuzu, however, was not born this way. Mm -hmm. He was born John Alexander Lawson in August of 1978 to Cynthia James and Timothy J. Lawson. Childhood pictures of him show a beautiful boy with bright blue eyes, blonde hair, and a wide, vulnerable smile. He was athletic and fairly happy. His parents separated in 1990, and John and his mother relocated to California to North Carolina, where Cynthia married for a second time. And there's not really known much known about child, his childhood, really. There's nothing out there that I could find, She or Loretta, who helped write this, that she could find, or anybody in any articles that they could find. We don't know. Nobody huh. can find anything. No, we don't know. I just need to know how to spell Pazuzu. P-A-Z-U-Z-U. Oh, okay. P-A-Z-U-Z-U, actually. I see you too, Jen. Mm-hmm. John's behavior began to change as a teen, and signs of mental illness could not be ignored any longer. His mother sought help for her one and only child. And the help, getting him help, he was diagnosed with schizotypal personality disorder, and agoraphobia. STPD is a mental health condition marked by a consistent pattern of intense discomfort with relationships and social interactions. People with STPD also have unusual thoughts, speech, and behavior, which usually hinders their ability to form and maintain relationships. Agoraphobia is an extreme or irrational fear of entering open or crowded Spaces or crowded places, leaving one's own home or being in places where escape is difficult. The level of agoraphobia is different for each person and can have periods where symptoms are worse than others. Cynthia's concern turned to anguish as she watched her beloved son's condition worsen and his relationship with his stepfather deteriorate to the point where her second marriage dissolved as well. In a documentary that I watched, it said that he told her mother to divorce her stepfather, and she did. So, and I'll talk uh, about the I'll talk about the documentary later because it's a really good one. I was just gonna say I think it would be hard to uh, maintain a marriage when you're trying to raise Lucifer as the uh, Mm. child. This this was before he was Pazuzu. Oh, this is all before. Quite simply, his mother didn't have the money to continue for his mental health, his therapy that John so desperately needed and the draw and influence of narcotics and alcohol far outweighed anything she, that she could offer him access to mental health treatment, money for the treatment and having time to take a loved one every week to receive the treatment is an uphill battle and especially hard for single parents. John began self-medicating at the age of 13 with alcohol and other drugs, which he would eventually become addicted to. John had already repeated second grade and was repeating ninth grade as well, for no other reason that he just never really showed up for classes. 
Faculty at West Forsyth High School still remember him, not because he gave them much trouble, but because he was usually absent. He was going by the name of Diablo at that time, which of course means devil. And other students called him, this is heartbreaking, turd boy because of how he smelled. Oh, hon. So it's safe to assume, or it's not shocking, that he dropped out of high school altogether. And to make a living, he began to sell drugs. After the World Trade Center attack in 2001, John began dressing in the traditional Arab headgear. Some have suggested that he did this because he wanted to identify as whatever Americans were afraid of, and he wanted to shock and scare people. But it also can't be ignored that this was also about the time he started to claim that he followed the Sumerian religion. What kind? Shortly thereafter, in 2002, John legally changed his name from John Alexander Lawson to Pazuzu Illa Algarod, which meant Lord of Locusts. Hmm. Pazuzu was the, God, I hope I pronounced this right, a Syro Babylonian demon of the southwest wind known for bringing famine during dry seasons and locusts during rainy seasons. You said demon, right? You did good. Oh, thanks. Demon. You're welcome. Demon. I learned it from you. He first appeared around the 6th century in what is present-day Iraq. In mythology, he's considered an evil demon, while at the same time, he protects against other malicious entities. Pazuzu is probably most well-known to modern Western audiences as the demon who possessed Reagan o McNeil, who possessed Reagan McNeil in the movie The Exorcist. That was the name of the demon that was inside with the whole your mother so socks in hell thing. That's right. That's right, buddy. Mm -hmm. Which is still a scary movie to me. It mm -hmm. Creeps me out. Me too. Why John latched onto the specific demon has not been explained publicly. Very well, at least. Crude attempts at Arabic writing and words and words could be found scribbled all over the walls of his house. And it's pretty obvious that he just made up a religion, borrowing a little of this and a little of that. Even people who belong to the Church of Satan have distanced themselves from Pazuzu Algarad. At one point, he told the doctor who performed a mental health evaluation on him that there were only two people in the whole world who belonged to and followed his religion. So your cult last week, the Children of Thunder. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. That I had Pazuzu. Three yeah, Pazuzu only had two. Oh, they, maybe they should have got together. They at mm -hmm. least had five. I'd be quite something if that happened. Differing beliefs, though, that probably wouldn't uh -huh. turn out so good. Pazuzu began making several modifications to his body, like shaved eyebrows, teeth filed to sharp points, a split tongue, mini tattoos, um, some of which, like the ones on his face were amateur attempts or self-inflicted. He had like a Nazi sign and a black demon tattooed on him. And some people say he had things like Lucifer and 666 tattooed on him. You know, all the things I, that a Satanist would have. I bet he had have. no problem trying to find a job. <laughs> uh, and he didn't work. Yeah. You can't when you're a world leader. Duh, Jen. Well, he was also on disability. Anyway. Body modification in and of itself does not mean a person is evil or capable of murder. That we know, you know. But at the time that Pazuzu had made these modifications, it wasn't exactly socially accepted as it is now. And it definitely signaled that he was unhappy with the status quo. And he desperately wanted to shock people. Like, desperate. That's what he wanted to do. His whole thing was shocking yeah. people. Well, I'd say, too, just to not that we have to point this out, but fa face tattoos are fine. Face tattoos of Nazi symbolism and things like that, that's going to be a no. Well, so I think I, that was on his back like, or something. Demon was on his, I don't, I don't know. Think, none of that's going to be acceptable today. Mm -hmm. Just saying. At this time, Pazuzu began to accumulate a bit of a following. He likened himself to good old Charlie Manson, and oh. he was equally enamored with Anton LaVey. He had several women that he called his fiancés. Their names were Dixie Ross. Crystal Matlock and Amber Birch, who was nicknamed Bubbles. Now, that kind of makes me laugh because you don't think a Satanist by the name of Bubbles. Well, I was just thinking Dixie, Amber, and what was the other one? Dixie, Crystal. Amber, Dixie, Amber, and Crystal. Mm-hmm. Okay. Amber's Bubbles. Bubbles. These women would do anything for him, anything that he asked. 
And it wasn't uncommon for Pazuzu to show videos of himself having sex with these women when his friends would come over to hang out. A friend of one of Pazuzu's fiancés said that he was naked the first time she visited the home, and he never bothered to get dressed the whole time she was there. That's a little awkward, I'm just going to say. Just keep your eyes up here. Eyes up here. No, wow. They were probably watering from the smell of the house. Oh, God. Uh-huh. And of course, one of the most troubling aspects of this is just how many other people would go to his house to party. People described him as being very charismatic. Pazuzu offered a place to exist without judgment to the outcasts and people living on the edge, people that needed to belong and to have acceptance. There was always an ample supply of drugs and alcohol, and a person could literally do anything they wanted in his house. It was a place for social pariahs to entertain their dark sides with no consequences. One friend described how when he opened up the door to Pazuzu's house, he was instantly hit with a wall of stench that he described as, quote, ammonia and urine. Ugh. Others described it as the smell of death. And yet they still hung out with Pazuzu in that festering pot of squalid animal and human waste. That cannot be healthy for you to mm. breathe. No. One, of, uh, one friend of Pazuzu's, a guy by the name of Crazy Dave Adams, said, quote, People would come visit his house because they knew it was free reign. There were no rules. There was nothing you had to abide by. You could piss in his carpet. You could smash a TV. You could hit somebody in the head with a beer bottle. You could throw a knife at the wall. It just didn't matter. In the documentary, it's called, I guess, The Devil You Know, and I found it. it There's about four or five episodes just on Pazuzu. They were saying that you'd walk in and people would just go to a corner and poop. Why, though? <laughs> oh, no. I don't it's understand. Me. Yeah. I but mean, I don't it's, understand. it's just not your hoarder house. It was bad. Yeah, I don't either. Pazuzu only bathed once a year and had given up breathing, brushing his teeth altogether, stating that he felt such actions, quote, stripped the body of its defenses and warding off infection and illness. And through all of that, Pazuzu's mother, Cynthia James, lived in the house with him. Wait, what? The mom lived there, too? <laughs> yeah. So I'm, ga I'm gathering nobody cleaned the house ever, 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 oh, ever. Oh, no. You can go online and find... Or you, pictures of the house and when no, they thanks. people finally go in they're using shovels to clean i mean mm -hmm. it's and they're in hazmat suits oh yeah it's mm -mm. Mm -hmm. I'm good thank you though in 2009 yeah. two unassuming men went missing one was tommy dean welsh born in 1978 one of three boys who grew up in arkansas and on the night of october 3rd 2009 tommy was supposed to spend it with his family he was supposed to spend the day with his family his brother, Rusty Welch, who worked for Domino's, he was going to bring home a pizza to his house that he shared with his wife and kids. And they were going to meet with Tommy and Tommy and his mom. They were going to watch a movie and eat dinner, right? Sounds like a fun mm. night at home. Tommy never showed up. Tommy mm. had been at Rusty's apartment earlier that day, but after giving hugs to everybody, he had to go home to fix a broken stereo, saying that he would be back later. Tommy walked mm. from his brother's apartment on Colonial Arms to the one he shared with his mother on Cook Avenue in Clemens, on Cook Avenue in Clemens. The distance was approximately a half mile. When Tommy never came back, the family got worried and went looking for him. And they found the stereo and it had been fixed and it even had one of Tommy's favorite albums on it, but no Tommy. A missing persons report was filed the next day on October 4th, 2009. Rusty said that over the next 24 hours, he had this gut feeling that something was wrong. According to Tommy's sister-in-law, Tommy always kept touch with his family. And honestly, Tommy was never seen alive again. In the summer of 2009, 32-year-old Joshua Frederick Witzler was a bit down on his luck. Described by his girlfriend, Stacy Carter, as sarcastic and unfiltered, he was a peace-loving hippie. Josh had a beaming smile and a big, bushy beard, and he was incredibly compassionate, especially towards animals. The couple first met in the summer of 1999 in Olympia, Georgia, nope, in Olympia, Washington, when Stacy, who had been wandering on a road trip, found herself at this big farmhouse where there would soon be a party. Later the same night, Josh came home from his job at the Olympia Cheese Factory, and they looked at each other pretty much, and the attraction was instantaneous. 
the couple decided to hit the road together and eventually ended up in North Carolina. The two made plans to open up a horse farm, so they bought property. Everything was going well, but when Stacy was injured by a horse, a horse fell on her, of all things, everything kind of went downhill. Things took a bad turn. Financially, they were at rock bottom, and the bank foreclosed on their farm. Josh, who was a talented hoof trimmer, would not take the job shoeing horses. Shoeing is a bit different if you just, like, a horse hoof is an actual, like, a fingernail, right? And to trim the horse, to be a hoof trimmer, you would just trim the nail, where actually if you were a shoer, you would actually nail the shoe into the hoof. Doesn't mm-hmm. cause the horse any pain, but some people just, he felt it was inhumane, basically. So he didn't take the job. Hmm. They have to have them, on, don't they? If I think they only have to have them if they're going to be walking on concrete or yeah. roads and stuff like that. Otherwise, they can just go barefoot, I guess. I guess that's the term, right? So anyway, he was a desperate need to make some quick money. Easiest thing for him to do is he went to selling pot and mushrooms, those little magic mushrooms. So by this point, the couple has had a son by the name of Jared. Stacy had no moral issue with him selling marijuana or mushrooms, but she thought that selling those kind of drugs would expose Jared to dangerous situations. And the couple split in 2005. And even so, Josh was still a devoted father who visited his son quite often. At one point, Josh was arrested for buying mushrooms through the U.S. mail, which, of course, turned this into a felony right away. His job prospects became even more limited with the new status as a felon, which only led him to continue to sell marijuana and mushrooms. Vicious cycle, I'm telling you. Yeah, it is. Plus, you make a lot of money not working that hard. Mm-hmm. But you should never, drugs by mail, just a bad no, no, choice. No no, 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 no. Get the feds involved. You don't want to do that. A carnival had offered him a job, but he couldn't go because of the rules of his probation. He wasn't allowed to leave the state. So when Josh disappeared in July of 2009, Stacy just assumed that he'd ignored his probation and left to join the carnival anyway. So I, I would think that. All right. So as a result of this, she didn't file a missing persons report until six months after Josh failed to contact any family during the Christmas holidays. So, you know, like the years go on and on and on. And pretty much his poor son pretty much felt that their father abandoned him or that mm-hmm. his father abandoned him. Something pretty happened. Pretty sad. No contact. Right. Mm-hmm. And it must be stated that many reports were filed with the Forsyth Police Department involving Pazuzu. He would openly tell people who came to his house that he'd killed people and buried them in his backyard. Some of those people tried to do the right thing by reporting that to the police. But guess what? Deaf ears. Police didn't really do anything. They're just like, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, Pazuzu would say, I claimed sex workers. I killed sex workers. I killed, Mm. you know, shock value. Mounds of ground freshly dug up in the backyard. He had a lot. Yeah. Plus, I mean, how could you even see it with all the junk around? I'm exactly. Guessing. Well, no, not really any junk, but. I, I meant junk, but I meant, you know. I don't think there was a lot of grass. Let's just put it that way. Yes. You know, Cam, one of my very first true crime podcasts that I ever listened to was the Generation Y podcast. And it's not surprising that a lot of fans of true crime have done the exact same thing. Ten years ago in 2012, hosts Justin and Aaron started this podcast together to discuss some of the craziest and most notable murders, crimes, and conspiracy theories. And after all these years, they still dive into a new case every week. You know, they really are amazing. Aaron and Justin dive deep into forensic evidence while covering every angle. They even talk to people close to the case. One of my favorite episodes is about Kimberly Rico, better known as the Valentine Murders. You see, Kim takes her husband on a romantic getaway that includes a murder mystery play, but that is just what she uses as a cover story to hide his murder for insurance money. It's always about the insurance money. Mm -hmm. Aaron and Justin also cover the big infamous cases like the Zodiac Killer, Evil Genius Bank Robbery, and the Tylenol Murders, which happened not too far away from us. 
I feel like I'm right there with them when they bring new theories to the table that I've never thought of. Follow the Generation Y podcast on Amazon Music or listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus on Apple Podcast or the Wondery app. In 2009, Matt Flowers, an Iraq veteran and friend of Algarod's, went to the police with this information. A neighbor, Tarina Billings, also went to the police when her father claimed that he had helped bury a body. Stacy Carter, the ex-girlfriend of Josh Witzel, had learned through a friend that they thought Josh was one of the people buried in Pazuzu's backyard. So she called the police and said, quote, you're going to think I'm crazy. <laughs> But I heard a rumor that Josh is buried in this guy Pazuzu's backyard. And the police didn't think she was crazy. Even Pazuzu's own mother had reached out to the police about one of the murders. Really? Yes. We'll get into it. Mm -hmm. The police finally did go to the house and told Pazuzu that they had concerned about a murder being committed on his property and that possibly a body was buried on the premises. And which, of course, Pazuzu denied it, right? I didn't do it. So what I happened? I don't know how it got there. Yeah. The police just left. They just left. In 2010, the police searched the premise with a search warrant, but found nothing indicating a murder or bodies being buried. One can only assume that the K-9 unit would not hit on the specific thing due to the home's condition. Um, still, no further action was taken against Algarod. But dogs are sensed for decay. I mean, tra- dogs are trained for, to pick up the decaying scent of a human. So I'm yeah, not for sure, but, unless the dogs weren't really qualified to do it. I don't you, know why. You said earlier there were dead animals all around and feces and urine and but vomit. But dogs, that if a dog is trained properly from what I read and seen, they are only trained to pick up the human decay, not anything else. Ugh, I don't know. Poor li- things are probably overwhelmed. I would think so. In May 2010, Pazuzu Algarod put his mother in a chokehold and nearly killed her. He was arrested and pleaded guilty to the misdemeanor insult of a female. He was placed on probation for 12 months. Uh, Pazuzu lived on SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income, because he was disabled to, due to his agoraphobia. Uh, he only received $500 a month. This probation pretty much was the equivalent of a good school. Golding, right? I mean, I don't think he or house arrest. He's already on house arrest. Exactly, because his own house arrest. Right. In June of 2010, on a boat ramp in Donaha Park, the body of Joseph Emmerich Chandler was found shortly before 9:40 a.m. by Yadkin County employees. Chandler, just 30 years old and legally blind, had died of a gunshot wound. There was no struggle, and robbery was not a motive. But the town, it was rumored that Nicholas Rizzi and Pazuzu had been on the dock with Chandler. How did Pazuzu leave the house? Aww, it comes and goes. That Remember it said that some days it's worse than others and some mm. people have I just kind of always thought more of it. couldn't leave. It. Yeah, I think there's different degrees and sometimes you have it worse than others. I'm, I don't know. I don't have it, so I can't really say much about it. Okay. After being arrested a few minutes later in October, 20-year-old Rizzi eventually accepted responsibility for Chandler's death, stating that the gun had just simply gone off accidentally. He apologized to Chandler's mother and was sentenced to a minimum of 13 months in prison for involuntary manslaughter. 13 months? That's it? Mm -hmm. Yep. 13 months. No explanation was ever given as why Rizzi didn't call the police if he'd truly been an accident. Some believe that the murder was intentional, including Chandler's mother, who said that the police treated her son's disappearance and immediate aftermath of the death as just, quote, oh, well, another dead black man. Un- so sad. Believable. Chandler was captured on security video at a store at 1.37 a.m. It's still not known how he ended up at the lake with Rizzi or Algarod. It's a question Chandler's mother still asks herself to this day. Whatever possessed her son to get in the car with them. I mean, who knows? I'm not even sure if they even know, knew each other, to be quite mm-hmm. often. 
to be quite honest. Pazuzu was convicted of accessory after the fact in the death and was given two years probation. Documents revealed that Pazuzu let Nicholas Rizzi stay in his home after the shooting to avoid being arrested. Apparently, the stinky house with satanic graffiti that had been the center of so much gossip revolving murder and drugs was the last place the police would think to look for Rizzi. I was just thinking <laughs> that would be the last place I'd want to be. Exactly. In 2011, one of Pazuzu's fiancés, Amber Birch, was accused of slapping and attempting to choke Pazuzu's mother. Birch, or Bubbles, was later convicted and sentenced Bubbles. to 12 months of probation. Yep. It's no way for someone named Bubbles to behave. Bubbles, I know. Two months after the conviction, she was charged with assault and battery for hitting Algarod in the face. Amber's friends, this is Bubbles, say that she hooked up with Pazuzu right after high school. Um, she was always a troubled girl, and she'd been looking for a father figure since hers had, since hers had abandoned her. And was with, Bubbles her stage name? That was just a nickname. Bubbles. That was her stage name. Yeah. No, I don't think she did anything mm -hmm. besides troubling stuff here. Always a troubled girl. She's been looking for a father figure since hers had abandoned her. And within months of meeting him, she'd shaved her eyebrows and had homemade tattoos. And, of course, was helping bury a body in the backyard. Finally, one day, Matt Flowers, our little Iraqi vet, had had enough. He would visit with Pazuzu every now and then, now and then to keep an eye on the situation, see what, what was going on, right? Police weren't doing a very good job. While Pazuzu's house was never anything out of an interior design catalog, Matt said that it wasn't always the cesspool that it had become in the early days. Matt had been at Pazuzu's on a few occasions and witnessed some terrifying things. Like one time there was a girl seated on the couch in the living room with both of her arms cut open from the shoulder to her wrists. And uh. she was bleeding all over herself. And, of course, the furniture, but like that matters. And after that, Matt never saw her at Pazuzu's place again. Another time, a man was so desperate for pain pills, he begged Pazuzu to smash his hand with a hammer so he could go to the hospital to get a drug prescription. Pazuzu, of course, said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And at the last minute, he turned the hammer around so the claw side would go into his hand, uh, chopped off the man's finger. What? Yeah. <laughs> Again, Matt never saw that man at Pazuzu's house either. Well, ever. I mean, also, to be fair, if any of that happened, would you ever go back there? No. So, or he could have done harm to him, either or. No, I don't know. But when Pazuzu had asked Matt to help him kill some random person who just stopped in to do some drugs and to get worked, you know, Matt told him, no, Matt's not a dummy. Matt went to the police and told them, quote, if you don't do something about Pazuzu, I will. And he had every intention of killing Pazuzu himself. Quote, the madness had to stop. I agree. It was October of 2014 that the Forsyth County authorities again went to Pazuzu's house with a search warrant. This time, they found the bodies of Josh Wetzler and Tommy Dean Welch buried in the backyard. Hmm. The autopsy report from the Wake Forest University School of Medicine Department of Pathology indicated that Tommy died of a gunshot wound to the head. The report said that the bullet's trajectory was from back to front and left to right. Shot him in the back of the head like a coward. Tommy's sister-in-law said, quote, It's kind of closure. It's peace to our hearts. We don't have to search any harder for Tommy. As with the case of Joseph Chandler, nobody seemed to understand how Tommy ended up at the Algarod house. Official records disclosed that Amber and Pazuzu had picked up Tommy at a gas station. He spent the last few hours of his life sitting on their couch drinking beer. There's never been any motive given for his murder. Nothing at all. Tommy's family was unaware of any connection that he had to Wetzler, Algarod, or any of his associates. Quote, Tommy was about family. He wouldn't, be into, he wouldn't be into the things that they were into. He wasn't into drugs. He wasn't into partying. Just mainly family, said his sister-in-law. Pazuzu's house on Hobnill Drive, where the bodies of Wetzler and Tommy Welch were discovered, is just a few blocks away from where Tommy's family used to live. And in fact, that tortured the family. I mean, they were so close to him, but they couldn't help him. Um, the fact that Welch's dead body laid in the house for days while Pazuzu tried to figure out what to do with him only furthered the family's torment. 
Pazuzu and Amber were each charged with first-degree murder and accessory after the fact of first-degree murder. Crystal Matlock was accused of helping Pazuzu bury one of the victims. Later in court, it would be revealed that Pazuzu shot and killed Josh Wetzler. Wetzler's former girlfriend, Stacy Carter, thinks that Josh had probably gone to Pazuzu's home to sell them some marijuana or some kind of drugs. And once there, Josh probably made some comments about the living conditions of the animals in the house. If Pazuzu mentioned animal sacrifices, which Pazuzu was wholeheartedly into, because he claimed to get high from eating the, quote, still beating heart of sacrificial animals, Josh would have had no qualms at expressing his opinion on the matter since he was so passionate about treating animals humanely. Remember, he wouldn't shoe a horse. And Stacy is convinced that this is probably what led to Josh's death. They ended up getting in a fight about the animal treatment or mistreatment, right. I guess. Yeah. Right. I mean, the animals were living in squal- squalor. There's dead animal carcasses in the home. <sighs> so the disgusting. guy wouldn't shoe a horse, which does not necessarily cause the, sh- the horse pain. You know what I mean? The guy mm-hmm. loved animals. Yeah. Amber Birch pleaded guilty to shooting Tommy. She was sentenced to 30 to 40 years and will, re- and will be released in May of 2045. She's currently serving her sentence in the North Carolina Correctional Institution for Women in Raleigh. When she pleaded guilty, Amber reportedly expressed regret about her crimes. Crystal Matlock, who helped Pazuzu dispose of Josh's body, served her sentence and was released in May of 2018. In January of 2020, Crystal was convicted of multiple drug crimes and breaking and entering and serving another eight months in prison. Now, one of the most troubling aspects of this case was, I mean, not that there's... As if none of that was... Uh, for me personally, was the fact that Pazuzu's own mother was in the house when her son shot Josh Wetzler. Well, she had to hear it. What did she think she was going did. on? She heard the gunshots and she came out of her room to see her son standing over Josh's body. Uh, she simply turned around, went into her room and continued to get ready for work. Hmm. I, I don't understand how you, I don't know. In later interviews, she said she was scared for her own life, so that's why she remained silent. Um, she so did eventually she get ready for work and then just exit the stinky house and go straight to police and say, Thank this you. is what I just witnessed. Yes. She did eventually right. go to the police with the information about the murders, but the police, nothing ever really came of that. Ultimately, the question has to be asked, right? If Pazuzu's own mother came forward with a tip about murder in her own home and a body buried in her own backyard... What more did the police need? True that they did search the premises once and found nothing. And it's also true that he they admitted that the canine unit would most likely not have performed effectively because of the house's conditions. Mm -hmm. But you know what? How could you? How many mothers go to the police with false information? Right. Good point. Good point. Right. I mean, why did they not take her more serious? I don't even know. It's oh, gosh. It's unreal. When police searched the house the last time in 2014, they had to call for the fire department to bring in hazmat suits. Hundreds of, yeah. I mean, those people that hung out at that house had to have some sort of infectious Mm -hmm. diseases in their lungs. You can't breathe that stuff in. There were hundreds of dead flies. Um, There was mold growing everywhere. They could smell the stench from the street. The health department eventually demolished the house. They raised it to the ground. And um, they deemed it unfit for human occupancy. Finally. You can, even if you changed all the drywall and carpet and flooring, no. you'd still have that smell. No. It's disgusting. Nope. And that's another question. Why was the house condition alone not enough to remove people? I mean, well, the police came in there the first the... time. Why didn't they take everybody out then? And the bothersome signs? I mean, you, you can have a right to say anything you want in your yard, but come on. Mm-hmm. Maybe we need to take a deeper look at this little house. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I can't anymore. It's gone. Oh, but you're, I get, I get what you're like saying. Like when yeah. they, you know, what's going on in there that, yeah. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. I think something weird, judging by this house, there might be something odd going on in this house. Let's get the health department mm-hmm. in to see mm-hmm. what the hell's going on. Yeah. If the upside down cross isn't welcoming enough, the signs telling you. Well, the smell alone. That, 
they had to have gone to the door and the, when the stench hit them. Door? They probably smell it well, outside, Jen. They did from the street. They could smell it from Blah. the street, but they should have... Whatever. Blah. Something so had gross. something was off with the police. They were scared of him. I don't know. In May of 2015, Pazuzu was transferred from the Forsyth County Jail to Central Prison in Raleigh for safekeeping. Um, transferred for safekeeping, usually because of security issues, meaning Did he go mental back health to John? disorders. Did he go back to John and the no. Popo or not? Nope. He was always Pazuzu. It oh. was legally his name. He had it changed. Yeah. Interesting. So a transfer for safekeeping is usually because of security issues or mental health disorders or other medical conditions. Quite simply, Pazuzu was a suicide risk. And this, of course, it was the second time, actually, that he had been transferred for safekeeping since he was first arrested. On the full moon of October 28th, 2015, at 2.40 a.m., Pazuzu Algarad was found dead in his cell at the Central Prison in Raleigh, North Carolina. An autopsy would later state that he died from severe blood loss caused by a wound to a major blood vessel in his left arm, somewhere near the pit of his elbow. The death was ruled a suicide, and even though it was never clear what object was used to inflict the wounds, authorities said he used something to cut himself. But they never found it? Nope. Items from his cell sent to the medical examiner's, examiner's office included an electric razor and a clear unlabeled body or no, and a clear unlabeled bottle filled with red fluid. And the red fluid has not been publicly identified. Is it blood? I don't know. It's never been identified. Did somebody come in there and kill him or did he ask somebody, hey, here, slice me and you can keep the shank? Mm, officials said there's no evidence to support the rampant rumors that Algarad bit his own arm to cause the wound to cause oh. the wound at the time. Well, they would know it was a bite mark, surely. But he couldn't exactly have done it with the electric razor and the bottle of red fluid. So unless the object he used to inflict the wound was removed or somehow concealed from investigators, that only leaves gnawing with his teeth or scraping with his fingernails. Oh, yuck. Mm, speculation and accusations flew in every direction. Pazuzu was on suicide watch. Now, so how was he left alone? Not only was he left alone long enough to harm himself, but long enough to bleed out. Why was he in jail at all, if not a mental facility? The answers to these questions are long and convoluted. I mean, some 25,000 open prison jobs in the state of North Carolina can't be filled because the jobs are dangerous and they don't pay a lot. And most people would rather flip burgers. I know I would. <laughs> I wish you could come home every night. Exactly. Um, and also funding for mental health care and the appropriate facilities have been slashed to the bone. The flip side to the Mayberry evangelical image in small town America is that good paying jobs with great benefits are scarce or out of reach for the average person. Plus, the opioid crisis is in full swing descending upon a population that has long been disappointed and disillusioned and are fighting to find a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And just the fact that Josh Wetzler, an all-around good-hearted, peace-loving hippie who wouldn't hurt a soul, would not only spend more time in federal prison for having mushrooms mailed to him than Pazuzu did for assaulting his mother and being an accessory after the fact to manslaughter, says a lot about the general chaos of the justice system. Well... <laughs> it's not wrong. It's not right? wrong. I, I think the first part about workers, though, uh, I, I don't know if that's necessary, true, but the opioid thing, that's totally right on. And then yeah. just the fact that, but we know that about the justice system because how come somebody can kill somebody and they get, you know, 12 years and somebody kills somebody else and they get the death penalty? Right. I know what circumstances surrounding it and things like that, but it's also states and differences and judges and juries and all that stuff. Right. Well, the fact that he died before he could be sentenced for his crime or even be studied for mental health reasons, the experts to get a chance to speak with him is horrible in its own right. But I'll, I mean, I can tell you for a fact that he was not a demon or a devil. I well, mean, I he was say, just maybe mentally deranged individual. He had mentally ill, but he was. You have to be to live in that squalor. That's oh. disgusting. Oh, it, and that's also it, a sign of mental. But then his mother kind of his mother was there. She must she had to have been scared of him. Something. Yeah. 
you know, it's just, I totally, totally, I want to force everybody out there to watch The Devil You Know because it really digs into it. It focuses, the guy who does most of it is Chad Nance. He's a journalist and he does a really good job of explaining the town and people that would always go to Pazuzu's house. You kind of follow two of them. They're like strung out on heroin and it's, the whole thing is so sad, Mm -hmm. just sad. At one point he talks, Chad Nance talks about his own son and I actually started to cry. And then, because I do that all the time now, but this is heartbreaking when he's talking about his son. Um, So much so that I made my husband go back and watch it. And my husband's like, holy crap, because it's heartbreaking. Just heartbreaking. Drugs are are terrible. And the grip that they hold on everybody. So, but yeah, Pazuzu, he was something. First of all, I would not want to be called demon every single day of my life, Pazuzu. So that, like, and the fact that he had it legally changed, which which cost money, is just well, my- it's just the whole thing. He wanted shock value. They people said that he liked to be what people are f- afraid of most, and this town Clemens is supposed supposedly very straightforward Christian. And well, what else is going to scare the town folks that are so Christian than the actual devil? But yeah, and then people lost their lives because of this. Well, Can sure I say fuckery? You know. Can I say mm-hmm. that? Is, no, is it fuckery? That. I think it's a mental illness. But well, also, it is. How, how but people he, went along with it. That's what I was going to say. How did he like? How did he not get help for that long? Right. And I get Ugh. it that it's expensive. I get, but something could have been done. The well, police could have can, condemned but, the house. But then where are they going to go? They're, I'm sorry. Where are they going to go? They're just going to go somewhere else and do the same thing. So, and you can put him, you can have him be put in a mental hospital for a while, but then that after the holds up, he goes. So then what happens, especially if he, he's an adult? Our mental health care system here in the U.S. is pretty... It's pretty messed up. Non-existent, it's, almost. It's, it's pretty messed up. Seriously, if we have... If you don't have a lot of money, then you... It's, there's very little, very little avenues you can take to get mentally healthy. hmm Yep. A lot of psychiatrists and psychologists don't even accept insurance. You have to pay straight out of pocket. And mm-hmm. we're, you're not talking a couple $20, you know, we're talking hundreds of dollars. I know somebody, somebody I know pays out of pocket $500 a visit and they visit weekly. Who has that kind of money? I know. But then again, you, how can you afford not to do it? Right. Well, I mean, I don't know if you don't have the money though. That's the thing. Luckily that person, I guess has money, has but if money. you literally do not have that money, he was on disability. His right, mom worked. making 500 a month. Right. And his yeah, mom so worked. How would but, you do that? You yeah. know what I mean? I don't well, know. I strongly urge everybody to watch The Devil You so Know. So do you with, think he killed himself or do you think somebody else killed him? Uh, he was, Pazuzu. Mm, it's kind of that whole uh, Jeffrey Einstein thing, you know? <laughs> Jeffrey Einstein? Not Einstein. What am I? Epstein? <sighs> Epstein. Thank you. Okay. I'm seeing it in my head. And I, I saw Einstein. Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein thing. Did he really kill himself? Did he not? If he's in seclusion because he's suicidal, they should have video of him. Well, but, Whitey Bulger lasted two hours in that new prison. Mm-hmm. So I think things happen. Things happen on purpose, if you know what I'm saying. And you would know where he bled out is right where you would put your mouth on your arm, right under your elbow. Mm. Ugh, yeah. he, he had pointed teeth. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. So it seems likely that maybe he did commit suicide, but he was also the whole shock value thing. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe somebody decided to take matters in their own hands. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. That was a good one, Jen. At I so thanks to Christina Young, like I said, I hope I we did this justice for you. It's really hard to focus on victims when the mad killer is so mad. mad. Is Christina from those parts? I'm not for sure. I'm guessing probably maybe so. I don't know. Huh. Since she's a over-the-road truck driver, 
I'm from every man where man. I'm from everywhere. Con boy. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I think. I've been. Oh no, that's I've been everywhere, right? Not yeah, I'm I've from been everywhere. everywhere man. Listen to me. I've been everywhere. You don't know what you're talking about. I need some sleep. Is what I need. You do. Right, but that's before good... I can go to sleep, you guys need to stay at the end of the show and listen to the new promo from our bestie Edward October from <gasps> October Pod VHS. He's got that. a new spooktacular spectacular halloween show called the halloween potluck october pods halloween potluck that is on youtube right now as we speak and of course like everything he puts out it's fantastic of course it is of course it is definitely go check it out there'll be a link to his uh youtube channel in the show notes yep i also want to just give a quick shout out my good friend Allie's brother-in-law listens to us jerry from georgia say hi jerry hi jerry thanks so much for putting through putting up with camille so you can listen to me i really appreciate that right right Uh, he said he thought we were funny (laughs) funny looking oh poor guy (laughs) oh boy thank you anyway uh yes thank you jerry and and, uh, until next time i guess jen remember lock your doors and keep passing by those open windows Uh, Bye-bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Jen. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya. You are invited to join the ghosts, the banshees, the fairies, and demons run amok. We're all coming to October Pod's Halloween Potluck. You'll enjoy this ghastly crew. If your blood doesn't end up in the stew, we'll be baking a cake and raising some hell. 
beware for heaven's sake, because we've got ghost stories to tell at October Pods Halloween Podluck. Coming to you too on Tuesday, October 11th. Get a special preview by listening to our companion podcast, October Pod AM, wherever you listen to podcasts. Or find all our links at OctoberPodVHS.com. OctoberPod, retro horror for bold individualists.